be going off in all sorts of different things later on when we get this. This is from Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 to 29. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. For you are all children of God through faith. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. You're going to read that sentiment, you're going to read that teaching later in James chapter 2. And one of the primary points that you need to pull out of that teaching is that you are made a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. One of the common misconceptions and one of the common errors of teaching is that, hey, we're all children of God. We are all creations of God. We are all created in his image, to be sure. But to gain, be made in a righteous, a right relationship with God, you are adopted as a son or a daughter of the Most High God. Now you are a child of God. And so remembering that, not in a prideful way, not in a way that builds walls, but in a way that empowers us to share by the power of God's Holy Spirit his will on earth as he renews this earth just as he renews our souls. That's the way it's supposed to work. It is only by his amazing grace nice transition that we, it's, it's uh, as possible in the least. And so we're going to sing this version of amazing grace. My chains are gone. <clears throat> Would you please stand as you're able?
go with a trap question, a trap theological question. So you can read the introductory verses of chapter 12 if, if you wish. But we pick up with verse 28. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now this sounds, now again, we 2,000 years can look back on this, and we look at this as the great commandment and all of those things, but what they were trying to do is get him to say something that would be unorthodox, something that would speak against the Ten Commandments, something that would speak against the law, something that would speak against Jewish tradition, something that would speak against trying to trap him. Well, none of them matter except whatever. But he has, he has, of course, the brilliant response. Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Other parts, other translations, other gospels say, in this are wrapped all of the commandments. All of them add up, as we've taught in here many times, when we talk about people saying the Ten Commandments are obsolete, ancient history, all that. Not at all. The Ten Commandments are the baseline of our morality. The first four deal with honoring God. The last six deal with honoring his creation. So you can literally, quite literally, look at the Ten Commandments and base your next thought, decision, behavior on the answer to the question. Does it honor God? Does it honor his creation? It is the very baseline of human morality. Very well put. The teacher of religious law replied, well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth by saying there is only one God and no other. Trying to trap him. You've spoken the truth. There is only one God and no other. That connects to their belief, monotheistic belief. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required by the law. If anything, this guy is getting to the edge of Jewish orthodoxy. What do you mean you don't need sacrifices? But it is the true understanding of the law that you practice it in your heart, knowing that you will fail and falling on your knees and praying for God to help you. He gets it. Jesus knows he gets it. Realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. So interesting things that we're going to pull out from James chapter 2 after this next song. Now, we have played the Chris Tomlin version of this. I want to play the hymn version of this. If you look in your hymnal on page 512, you will see the parts that are divided in the chorus. And you can go ahead and attempt them as you wish. I will not be singing much of this because I've never played the hymn before. I will be very focused on the accompaniment. So let's have at it. It's an actually a very upbeat hymn that goes rather quickly. Let's try to enjoy this together. First time for me, uh, I didn't even know it was a hymn. I only knew the Chris, like I always say, I say this if anybody will listen. I think one of the greatest advantages I have as a pastor is not being raised in the church. The only thing I ever have to depend on is the Bible. I didn't even know that this was a hymn until I was singing in the Chris Tomlin version. And remember, Pete, he said, do you know that's a hymn? It's a different hymn. I said, what? And he said, yeah. And he goes, 512, and he sang it one time, and I said, you need to. So here we go. We're going to give it a try, uh, see if we can uh, get the right tempo.
Scripture, James chapter 3. And we've been working a lot in James chapter 3, haven't we, Josh? Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, and I, and I, I have every right to that. As an old ex-football coach, like I was raised as a redneck in a football coach, knowing about three adjectives, none of which you can say in church. Okay? So James chapter 3 has been something that I have grown in as well. So we will work through that together. But right now, James chapter 2. There are two big preaching points that I want to draw out of this scripture today, and you'll see what they are. One of them is the most common understanding when it comes to people uh, and their understanding of what James is teaching. But the first one is this. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ, if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes, expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes, if you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there, or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? And that's what I want to draw out. Don't go on to talk about the virtue of poor and how virtue, when you are wealthy, the virtue of your behavior. Now, what I mean by that is this. Uh, listen or give me that mic. There isn't a problem here with the way that they're treating the wealthy person. Right? There's a problem, obviously, with the way that they're treating the poor person. And when we just read Love your neighbor as yourself. And when we just read in Christ Jesus, there is no Jew or Gentile, male or female, Greek or... This doesn't make any sense. This does not jive with the teachings of Jesus. When we 
we just finished that first scripture and said, when we are saved, as we sing in church, we are adopted into the family of God, we become brothers and sisters of one another, then this teaching, this acting this way, I should say, doesn't make any sense. It's not good. It doesn't jive with the teachings of Jesus. Whether that person is rich or poor, male or female, Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. The race of that individual, wherever they may come from, doesn't matter. If they are adopted into the family of God, then they are adopted into the family of God. If you have a brother or a sister, and you are blessed with decent job, and you got your family, and you got your house and all that, and your brother or your sister, they may struggle. Do you hate them? Do you treat them poorly? I hope not. Regardless of their station in life, relative to your station in life, we treat them as family. Well, that person, because they're, they're not at my station in life, they're not welcome in my home. Shame on you. And Jesus is saying the same thing. We talked about the diversity of the church, the original, universal, diverse organization is the Christian church. It's only until recent modern history have we sort of built these little silos into which we place ourselves. It's a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-belief system. As we've talked about many of these letters, people are bringing in pagan belief systems, non-belief systems, and antagonistic belief systems. And Christ is dealing with all of them. And the way he deals with them is universal, not relative. Say, oh, well, I just said, I was not raised, per se, in the church. I don't know a lot of churchy stuff. And the more churchy stuff I learn, the more I want to stay away from churchy stuff. But if you say, I was raised in the church, and I know all of the churchy stuff, therefore, my spiritual station is way above your spiritual station. not the way it works. And we remember things from teachings of Jesus like the 11th hour, which always gets a lot of people stoked. You mean that if a person repents on their deathbed and it's, and it's truly heart, that's your condition, right? Only Christ knows your heart. It's truly heartfelt that they are forgiven. They are. But I spent my whole life like trying to be good. I got you. But there's the truth of Scripture in action. It is contingent, as I mentioned, upon pure, true repentance. You can't play God and play him, not as in play him like act like him, but play him like you're going to be a player. And say, oh, I'm going to live my life the way I want to, and just try to out-guess death. And I'm feeling kind of sick today, be out with them. It doesn't work that way. But yes, true repentance at the last time. Saves the soul. So he goes, he, he goes on, he talks about poor, and, and, and Christ brings this out about the poor. Remember the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor, poor in spirit. There's much made about the poor, and the reason why is because the poor have many less idols in front of them to worship than do the wealthy. And so it's not just like, oh, I want to upraise the poor. It's not a sort of a social justice gospel of raising the poor. It's used as teaching because if you have little, then you have little between you and Jesus. We, as a wealthy nation, and we, as I look here, you know, the wealthy people, we have a lot of things that can become between us and Jesus, a lot of things, things that we can worship and place before him. I can't go to church today because the Cowboys are playing. What? Or the Redskins. I can't say the Redskins anymore, Ron. The Commanders. Right? Now, not that you've ever done that. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. But you 
know what I'm talking about. I can't come to church and whatever the case may be. My praying time, well, it's been cut back because I have been binge watching this incredible series on Netflix. What? And I'm guilty. I saw some jaws over in there going, whoa, that's one of them? Yeah, that's one of them too. That's one of them too. But it's a really good series. Gotcha. I hope that the replaying is in hell. Because <laughs> I've already said, don't be astonished. Okay? But these are the things that get in our way. Can we worship as a family? Well, we've got to do this, that, and the other thing. Mom, Dad are going here, this, that, and the other thing. Hmm? Are we idolizing our work? Some people, when we talk about marriage, we talk about idolizing our husband or idolizing our wives. We don't talk about the priorities of the personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Then, the relationship that you have as man and woman in the relationship of marriage then your children, then other things like new jobs, friends, etc. But those priorities and not placing people, your wife or even your children above Christ. And I preach that and you know, but that doesn't preach well on Mother's Day. My kids, I would not, I'm glad that you were glad to see the son of God when I preach in the heart to do that. But I don't worship much as I love them, and, and there he is sitting in the back, he's not worthy of my worship. He's not. Christ is. And the reason he is here is because of a union between Kelly and I as a married couple. God, our marriage, children, we keep going down. Those priorities are in line. All else seems to be on God's teach that in, in, in men's groups, you hear that again tonight, if you come, because men want to, we feel as though we have to put everything above, and, and we end up idolizing and worshiping, really what we're doing is idolizing and worshiping ourselves when we think that our family can't get out without me, when we think that they, they won't give me money without me, when we think that they'll let me, 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 that my family, my wife, my everything depends upon me. What we're doing is worshiping ourselves. Look how important I am. We're not trusting God. So he goes on. I'll pick it back up. Um, let's pick up with verse 8. Go to verse 8. Next slide, okay? Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself. But as if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. The law of love. God is love. The law of love. The difficult doctrine of God's love. I don't want to love that. can't change the truth of that. Now that is the difficult doctrine of God's love. We don't, that doesn't mean that we cower and accommodate and do all of these different things. We live in God's love and we share the truth of God's love. With compassion. Compassion is a wonderful thing, but can be very unhelpful at times. If I know somebody who has cancer and I say, oh, I'm very, very sorry that you have cancer. I feel very, very bad for you. I mean, I don't care if it eats up your body when you die, but I really feel sorry for you. It's a fact. What does this do for me? It's not very helpful for me to say that and show that individual that kind of compassion and tell them the truth. So the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as the person who's broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone, but you don't commit adultery, you still have broken the law. Hopefully that would be a good example. You can't go before the judge after murdering someone and say, yes, but I never slept with another woman. So it's like, okay. Life's imprisonment. <laughs> so whatever you say, whatever you do, remember 
remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. Now there's been some points of confusion theologically when you talk about the Lord and the law, the law that sets you free, because aren't we taught that the law was there to sort of condemn you, to hem you in, to show you how unworthy you are and how much you need God. When we talk about the law that sets you free, and I just sort of gave away the answer, the law who sets you free. Who is the appropriate pronoun there? Because who was it? Who was the perfect embodiment of the law? The royal law. The royal priesthood. The royal high priest, Jesus Christ. The law that sets you free is faith in the one who completed the law perfectly and lived a life, the only human being to do so, that was not that was not worthy of condemnation. We have faith in the one who did that, and not only the one who did that, but the one who said, I know, right, he knew, <clears throat> I am the one undeserving of God's wrath, but on your behalf, I will willingly go to the cross and experience God's wrath so that you do not have to. And faith in that completed work of the cross, as we say, is what sets us free. You will be judged by the law that sets you free. One final point, because people don't want to accept this today either, and I've preached this before. Jesus Christ is the Logos. He is the Creator. Through him, all things were created. Without him, nothing was created. He's creator. He is redeemer. So we see the only human being that did not deserve to die willingly went to the cross to redeem God's creation. All of it. Human beings, the earth, all of it. Starting something new. He is judge. This is the part that we don't want to hear. And we start learning about that first, even in John chapter 3. He says, human beings have been judged because the standard by which you are judged walks among you. And faith in him and understanding him, you are, you, the judgment is here. And basically he says, you have all the information that you need now as you see Jesus Christ, as you hear Jesus Christ, as you experience Jesus Christ, you have all the information that you need now to make your decision. And you will be judged upon that decision. Because you know the truth. You have seen the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. When we read in Revelation who's coming back and what he does, he's judging good and evil. And after many attempts, if you will, to demonstrate to those who are lost and those who are blind the power and the goodness of God, the final judgment will come, good and evil. That's Christ. I know we hear the we hear the new age gospel and we hear the social justice gospel and we hear all these things and and and, and we just believe that Jesus Christ two three inches off the ground floated around and bless you this and bless you that but there is a real systematic approach to God's salvific history of humankind and understanding the reality of who Christ is is paramount Sisters, 
If you say you have faith, you don't show it by your actions. Now, this is the piece of James that's both the most familiar with. Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister that has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye and have a good day. They want to eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? And that's kind of my comparison when I, I used the analogy earlier. Great. Great compassion. Oh, you're poor? That's so bad. You have nothing to eat? No place to stay? I feel terrible for you. Bye. Have a nice day. It's not, it's not working. You're not building the kingdom of God. It's a very simple example, but a very profound example of the way to behave with one another. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. See, that's the mistake. Faith isn't enough for salvation. We learn that salvation comes through hearing. Salvation comes through faith in the completed work of the cross. What he's teaching and what we all know is discipleship that as we are saved and we turn our wills over to the will of God, we say, what would you have us me do right now? Collectively as a church, what would you have us do right now? You don't get, oh Lord, I'm saved. I'm all right. I've got about 30 more years, God willing, and I'll die and go to heaven. That's it. That's no life. That's no life, period. Christian or not. And that's not what the Christian does. Oh, wait, you know, it was really hard stuff. I am saved. I am indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. I'll just wait around and die. That doesn't make any sense to me. But that's the whole put your head down, raise your hand, say a prayer kind of teaching that we have in the church that the ultimate goal is to get to heaven. The, uh, the being a part of heaven <clears throat> is part of salvation. Okay. Faith itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. I have just said a thousand times if I have said it once, Satan has no interest in a dead church. He's already got them. Satan has no interest in a dead person. He's already got them. You're not going to see too many spiritual attacks on churches that are not praying and faithful and seeking God's will. You're not going to see too many spiritual attacks on individuals who say, well, I'm saved, I'm good, and go out and live like hell six days a week and go to church on Sunday morning. You won't see too many spiritual attacks. Satan's going, yeah, show us. We need more people in that direction. Thank you. As we're going to learn tonight, you were born on a battlefield. Boom. Someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. There's the demonstration. The fruit of the Spirit as it moves forward through you as a vessel of God's Holy Spirit. And that manifests in many different ways, many of which we've talked about here. When that individual is coming at you hard, and they're acting like every kind of jerk that you can possibly imagine, and you demonstrate the patience and the love and the calmness, and you maybe say something, something is really intensely bothering me. I'm glad that I was here for you to get this. Is there anything else that we can talk about? You could go back that way. Christians should. But I may lead to the very question, why are you acting that way? Well, let me tell you. It's because I believe God led me to this conversation today. I believe that I'm here in front of you for a reason. And I would like to share with you that reason. I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You can make an idol out of that, and I will say many folks, many churches do. Worship.
mature, so we should do this, that, and the other thing for the sake of doing them. Why? Because we're mature. No. We enter into submission, in being prayer, in submission to seek God's will as to what we should do. God will gift churches and bodies just as he gifts people and individuals. And where is he using this body? What would he like us to do? Doing things for the sake of doing them, because we think they sound churchy or are churchy, or, or, or whatever the case, is dead fruit on the vine. And God, and Jesus Christ himself said, we do that, but we did this in your name, we did that in your name, we did this in your name, and he says, I never asked you to do any of those things. Get behind me. God, what I was asking you to do, you never did before. He says that in the churches of Revelation over and over again. He says that to his disciples. Listen, if you will hear my voice. Why? Why do they need to hear his voice? If we're just going to do what we want to anyway, because we read it in the book, 101 ways to outreach to your community. Well, let's try 99 of them. Why not? Well, probably because God's not asking you to do that. If he is, God bless. You will see that organic fruit of the Spirit grow. And individuals will say, this is, this is really a calling. This is really something that I'm being led by the Lord. And a team comes together. And people come together. And a ministry comes together. And that's why in this church we don't have segmented ministries just for the sake of having them. Because other churches have them. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds. I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? Or are you just sitting there waiting to die? I will show you my faith by my good deeds, the fruit of the Spirit. You say you have faith, so you believe that there is one God. <clears throat> Final point for today. Because this is something that is very important. As I mentioned, we are mulling on a spiritual battlefield. Because Satan doesn't care. The opposer of God's will, which is to be in relationship with you, or, and in fellow as you are in faith, so that you may partake in the age to come with him. The opposer of that doesn't care if you miss that. I've said this a million times, if I've said it once, by a millimeter or by a mile, as long as you miss it. So that's why we talk about being steeped in the word of God. That's why we talk about hearing God's voice. That's why we talk about knowing God's truth. That's why we talk about going deeper than, and I don't mean any disrespect with this, but going deeper than Sunday school lessons. In terms of what the Bible is saying and how the Bible is saying it and what it means to you. Because Satan knows it inside and out. And if you don't, you're opening yourself to be schemed and tricked. Remember, soldiers wear camo for a reason. It's a tactical advantage. And Satan's in a camo. <laughs> and he's, he's there. And that's his tactical advantage. Knowing the word of God. Because it says right here, you say you have faith, but you believe that there is one God. And he's a little sarcastic. Good for you. Even the demons believe this. And they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? A demon who is possessing an image bearer of God is not going to produce the 
the same fruit as God's Holy Spirit possessing, if you will, an image bearer of God. The old saying, if you know what what to do, believe. So we do it and say, watch what they do. Let's look at the fruit of the Spirit and where that fruit is leading people in the kingdom of God. To the truth and then whoop, a little bit of an end around here to serve our own purposes or to the truth and through the cross and the hard understanding of the reality that the Lord presents through his word. We don't like that. We like relativism. We want it to be about us. We want it to be about my power over God, not God's power over me. Submission does not come naturally to the broken human. So then, if you remember the stuff about, yeah, the stuff, <laughs> like I'm like sort of blowing it off. The stuff about Abraham and so forth is in the last verses of chapter 2. And we read that earlier. The faith of Abraham. And that's the demonstration and the Jewish link. Right? When we talk about you could, in the in, in, in Jewish sacrificial system, you could go through the motions then, just as you could go through the motions now. And you could do your sacrifices, but if there's not heartfelt repentance, and you are doing those sacrifices because you are commanded, and your heart and your prayers are going up with those sacrifices, they're useless. And we can go through the motions today, as Christians, and they're completely useless. Sitting in this church on Sunday doesn't make you any more of a Christian than you sitting in a garage Sunday morning makes you a punk. There's more to it than that. And that's what James is teaching. Now, final comment. We've talked a lot about the context of James. Man, you can see why this dude was thrown off the roof. He's living in a wealthy city. He's, he's talking about this. Can you think, we talk about racism, we talk about stratification today. You don't know your history in the way it was in the ancient world. You were born at your station, you stayed at your station, if you moved from your station, if you attempted to move from your station, that was it. To say all are welcome, slave and free, Jew, Gentile, man, woman, was crazy enough to just stop there and would have blown up the culture. But for the Christian community to say all races, backgrounds, sexes, tongues, here. This is what changes the world. You can see now, you can see now, especially since World War II, you can see now how we have compartmentalized things in mind and are getting away from the ultimate community of diversity that there ever was. The way God intended it. And again, seeking that truth as calmly as he does, as well versed as he is, seeking that truth into that culture at that time was absolutely earth changing. World changing. And this room won't believe me, but it's true. But it's a test for us. Because here I am preaching the same truth. That was a joke. You can, you can, well, maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Maybe you're all like, you know what? I don't want to hear what this guy has to say. I'm bringing a ladder to church, right? That steeple's pretty high. Let's see if we can get up there. Uh, I don't want to hear this stuff. I want, to, I want my own road, my own life, my own. I want to worship myself. I want to worship other things. This is exactly what got James in trouble. So I hope you're hearing that. When you get in front of the mirror, so 
Think about all of your relationships. Think about all of your possessions. Think about your career. Think about what gets you clean. I don't mean to off on idols or although again there's graven image, right? <laughs> Do see the uh, second commandment violation. But what gets you clean in Christ? That you should. There's my father's good gift for you. So evaluate and humble yourself before the Lord. Find out what your idols are. And that's a very awful way to end things, but that's how I want to end it. We're going to transition into our time of praise and testimony and prayer. Um, why don't we stand? We'll stretch our legs. We'll sing. Turn our eyes upon. And then we'll share our testimony. I know that you're sticking around because we want to. We want to. This this young man today, next week, next Sunday at two p.m. He enters into the state police academy for six months. Um, he's a young man that I coach and the back uh, coach, Jenny Mike Brown Miller, his father, daughter, sister. talking yesterday about those sorts of things and it's really not so much the physical part you're going to need this because you're going to be called every name in the book and things that people make up on the spot things that are going to be done to you and said to you and you are going to be condemned and you are going to and you are going to have to have that fruit of the spirit to, to handle not just handle that but help to move these people and heal these people, guide, at least guide these people and show them. This is what I always said in alternative education. At the very least, I can show these kids a different way of behaving. And at the very least, you meet them in a situation and they, they, they see a different way of behaving. And that may be the only seed that you're able to plant, but it's also true as well, talking about seeds and spirits, just like in my alternative education book, I can be MF up one side and down the other and call them every name in the book and they would go after home. They would go after my looks and everything else. That, that's, if I snap one time, there's my career. There's some possible children. So it all can be done to you. You snap one time, it's all over. And so we both live that and you're going to live it to a, a degree that's ten times So it better be a call. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You better have some backing of a sovereign God uh, because that's, that's the reality of the situation. So I've already given away a little of our prayer time. Stand as you're able. Let's just rejoice. Let's sing. We'll provide our testimonies.